And so, as we normally begin every single class, we're going to start off the class by doing the class for the Refua Shlema and also for the people that have passed away to do that in their Zechut. So first, we'll start off with the people that have passed away. If there's any names, let's let's say the names now. And to all the people that passed away this past year and, and before them that need an aliyah, may Hashem give their nishamot all the aliyot that they need. Amen. 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 And for the people that need refua shlema, Avram ben Juli. Avram ben Juli. Eli ben Chana. Eli ben Chana. Yehoshua ben Avram. Yehoshua ben Avram. Muriel Batoriet. Muriel Batoriet. Yitzhak ben Rachel. Vera David. Ben Rachel. Ben Rachel. Miriam Elna May Hashem heal them all speedily. Amen. Can you answer? All right. So, as usual, I'm going to give a little bit of a breakdown on the parasha, and then we're going to jump in and we're going to go hopefully to try to understand with the help of Hashem some of the secrets behind what seems like either a bizarre story or something that happens in the parasha. So tonight we're going to talk about three different things. We're going to talk about the story of Yaakov Avinu with the dream. It's the very beginning of the parasha. It's, the most, it's one of the most interesting stories that happened in the Tanakh. And it's one of the most interesting dreams in general. We're going to talk about the letter Aleph and some of the secrets behind the letter Aleph. Um, and for those that were at some of the other classes before, when we gave the Midrash about when Hashem created the world, how we created different letters... And then he started with the Aleph, the reason why he started with the letter Aleph. We're going to get a little bit into that. And then we're going to talk tonight also about the difference between a Tzadik and a Rasha. So those are going to be the three main concepts for tonight. So Tzadik and Rasha is essentially a Tzadik is a righteous person and a Rasha is an evil person. But the main thing that we're going to go to is what's the difference between them. So do you want me to open up another bottle of wine? No, no, it's good. There is another one that we might need to open it up, so... Because other people are going to probably want it. Don't worry about it. They're all going to start drinking soon. Here, here, here we go. So, the parasha of the week, like we usually do, we're going to give a little bit of a background on the parasha, and then we're going to dive into it. And we're going to ask some main questions that are brought up either by the Mefarshim, the simple commentaries or the mystical commentaries that are brought up, and then we're going to try to answer some of them. Okay? So, the parasha we pick up after the story of last week's parasha, where Yitzchak gave the bracha to Yaakov. Esav walks in, very angry and sad. In fact, this is the beginning of how Esav wants to actually kill Yaakov, and wants to start to pursue him. So once he starts going about that journey, we're going to see how it actually plays out uh, from there. After that, he goes, um, essentially, Rivka tells Yaakov, it's time for you to leave because Esav wants to kill you and you took the bracha. So she recommends that he goes to the house of Laban, her brother. And eventually, on his way, he's, before he goes to Laban, he decides to go to the yeshiva of Shem and Ever, um, which are the ancestors and the yeshivot that Avraham Avinu learned in and is the yeshiva that also Yitzchak learned in, to be able to gain some strength for those 14 years. So he learned in the yeshiva for 14 years. And then he eventually finds his way to a location where he calls it Beit El. He has the dream. And then he gets ready to go out to the house of Lavan and, uh, and meet eventually his two wives that he's going to marry, which are Leah and Rachel. So this parasha goes through eventually the meeting of Leah and Rachel. Um, but we're going to focus mainly tonight on the story of the dream. Okay, so with that being said, and that's a little bit of the background in the parasha, I think it's important to understand from the perspective of Yaakov where we're at before we can ask the questions that we are essentially asking at this point. And so after 
Yaakov gets the bracha of Yitzchak, okay, and he lived and he grew up in the house of Yitzchak and Avram in the Torah and the Mitzvot. It says Ishtam Yosheb Alim that he was a man that sat in multiple tents. The Zohar and the Kabbalah and the Parshiot say that it's a reference to him sitting in the tents of his fathers, meaning that he sat in the tent of Avram and the tent of Yitzchak, which is essentially a reference to the fact that he learned from the chesed of his grandfather and the gvura of his father. And together, this is in the mystical sense, he created a perfection of the right side and the left side to form a unity in the center. And that's why in the Sfirot, when you look at the spheres, you'll see that there's the spheres on the right, the spheres on the left, and then there's the ones in the middle. Yaakov is the perfection of the spheres on the right and the left, and in the middle. And so, he's asked by his mom, Rachel, at this point, to leave. And when he leaves, uh, yeah, by his mom, Rivka, excuse me, to leave. And when he leaves at this point, he is essentially heartbroken because his brother wants to kill him. Um, he accepted the bracha and he's done nothing really wrong in his life because all he wants is to bring about the salvation for the Jewish people. He's learnt with his father and he spends his time doing Torah and mitzvot. So all he wants to do is be close to the tzaddik, which is Yitzchak Avinu of the generation at the time, over there to be next to his father, and to stay in the Holy Land of Israel and just learn the Torah. But he's forced to leave. And where does his mom essentially send him? She says, go to Lavan. So he's so torn because Lavan, we know Kabbalistically, is almost like the head of the snake, is referenced in the Kabbalah. Because Lavan, it's written even mystically that Lavan would manipulate anyone with his mind. That's the level of sorcery that he had. Anyone that he would meet, no matter how holy they were in Torah, or mitzvot, or anything, he could confuse anyone. So that's the level of sophistication that was involved in Lavan. We're not going to talk so much about Lavan tonight, but understand that Yaakov knew that he was going to enter into the garden, essentially, of Eden with the, encountering the snake. So he knew that he was going to see the one side of the Yitzhah, but he can't stay at home because the other side of the Yitzhah, which is Esav, which is one, a person that murders, steals, and does every single capital punishment that you could imagine, which we discussed last week, wants to kill him as well. So he doesn't know what to do. And he essentially says, I'm going to reinforce myself. And he goes for 14 years to learn in the yeshiva of Shem and Ever. And after those 14 years, he finally makes his way to eventually get to the point of where he's going to go to Lavan. But in this moment, he's... He's looking for Hashem because he can't find Hashem in his life. He thought he accepted the bracha. He doesn't see Hashem for 14 years. He's being rejected from home. He doesn't see Hashem. He has to go to the Satan, essentially, which is Lavan. Satan is another word for devil. And he doesn't really know what to do. So he essentially hits this point of a depression, a falling of like, where is Hashem in my life? Okay, which is going to be the main underlying theme of the whole essence behind Yaakov's story. Okay, and then... He gets to this location. He finds 12 stones over there. Bless you. Uh, he finds 12 stones over there, 12 special stones, puts them around his head. It's a very mystical idea. He puts them around his head. They all unify as one stone under his head. And then he has a dream. In the dream, he sees that there's angels going up, going down, and there's a, heav there's a ladder that goes from this earth all the way up to heaven. But the head of the ladder is reaching into the heavens. So it's very mystical. When he gets up, he then realizes that this is a place of where Hashem is. Hashem blesses him. He gives him the brachot that he gave and he promised his forefathers, Avram and Yitzchak. And then he says, oh, this is the place where Hashem lives. And he has this recognition, like, oh, Hashem's here. And then that's kind of the story. And then he's ready to go off and, and meet Lavan. So there's a lot of very obvious questions over here, right? What's the deal with the dream? Why angels? Why the ladder? What's the deal with the stones? What's the deal with the location? Why does he dream over here? All of that. Um, when he dreams, it's before he goes to the what? yeshiva or after? After the yeshiva. After on the, the way to Lavan. Oh. After, oh. after, oh. oh. after the 14 years. On the way back. After the 14 years, exactly. And, and also one last question, which we're going to get into tonight, is also why the parasha is called Bayetze. Right? So we know it's the first word. What does word, it mean, Bayetze? And he left and he, and he yes. went out. He departed. Yes. So um, we know that the words of every parasha have a significance. We talked last week about toldot. Toldot is generations. We know that in last week, according to the Kabbalah, every generation of the Jewish people's names can be found in permutation in the parasha of last week, according to the mystical teachings. Okay? So there's already a lot of depth behind different parashiot and the reason why different parashiot are named, what they are. This one's named Vayetze. We're going to get a little bit into the reason for it. To get into, now that we explained kind of those questions, to start to understand this and now to finally di dig a little bit deep into it, we're going to go to a Gemara, a Gemara in Baba Batra. And it's actually referenced because it's also a lesson in Nikutimaran. 
It's in Likutei Maran Lesson 14. So, in, Gema, in the Gemara of Baba Vatra, page 74a, there's a story of a rabbi named Rabba Bar Barhana. Okay? He was a rabbi that lived in the time of the Gemara. He's a very, very special holy man. Names of rabbis that lived in the time of the Gemara, all their names and all their references... Um, were incredibly significant. We know that the names of the rabbis that are written down in the Gemara could have had or had um, the ability to do Tchiyat HaMetim. So these are people... Tchiyat HaMetim is resurrection of the dead, so that people understand. These are people that had a tremendous amount of mystical knowledge and wisdom of the Kabbalah. So these are people that were very, very special. Okay? The reason why I'm bringing up this story, we're going to get into in a second and how it's connected to the Pasha, but the beauty of the story and the connection is that it actually stems to a connection with Rabbi Nachman and the reason why I'm bringing up Likute Maran. So Rabbi Nachman, when Rabbi Nachman was about 23 years old, um, I don't have the exact confirmed date, but it was around 23 years old, he had Rabbi Bar Barachana come to him and appear to him. Rabbi, Rabbi Bar Barachana lived in the time of the Gemara, so we're talking about a few thousand years ago. Okay? He appeared to him and he told him, Rabbi Nachman, your teachings in the heaven are shaking up the world that everybody is bringing, it's bringing incredible joy to the world. Every single teaching that you reveal up there. So he said, I want to ask of you a favor. He said, the favor that I want is that God willing, with your help, I want you to be able to reveal the inner meanings of my teachings, my stories that are in the Gemara that no one understands. So we know the stories of Rabbi Barbar Khan and the Gemara are very mystical stories. There are stories that are written, like, for example, it'll say that there was a snake, and the snake's head was the size of 14 villages. That snake was eaten by an eagle. That eagle was the size of 90 villages. So there's a lot of secrets. It's very mystical. It's very deep. And no one really understands the story. So one of them we're going to get into tonight. There's about 15 of them, I think, in the Gemara and Total. And Rabbi Nachman took it upon himself, and he said, okay. He took it upon himself to reveal, and in the very beginning of his book, Likwit Iman, he goes through the first 14, 15 lessons, he reveals the secrets behind every single one of these lessons. There are Mekubalim and there are Kabbalists for the last few thousand years that have tried to interpret these stories that have failed. Very few people have admittedly come out and said that this is the only interpretation, the only meaning behind the stories. Very few people had a deep understanding enough to be able to go into the secrets behind it. So you'll see from this story, it's a very mystical story. It's a little bit shorter than the other ones, but just within this one, it's incredible. So, Rabbi Barakhan, at the time of the Gemara, he was actually asked, they said, what to do with these stories? Because he used to get the story was revealed to him. And we're going to get into the story right now, and I'll read it to you directly. And they used to say, what do you want us to do with this story? He said, put in the Gemara. And the words he used was that it was very small. These little words, these little stories, these small things can reveal a lot in the world. But that people didn't really know how it was. We know that secrets of stories reveal the deepest secrets because the things that cannot be explained in traditional language is actually hidden within a story. That's why Rabbi Nachman, towards the end, he revealed 13 tales, 13 mystical tales. He said, because I realized that people were not understanding the Torah as I was revealing it to then, he said, so now I'm going to start to hide it and give it in stories that will grab people's attention. They think they may start to understand, but in it, there's even deeper teachings than the other Torahs that I had. And actually, can I add something? Yeah. They are not the only one because the Baal Shem Tov actually said that when he was helping people and one day someone came to see him and they couldn't have children and he told them a story. And they said, but I don't understand what the story helps me to have children. And he said, true, when you listen to the story, it will be a remedy for you to have children. And that's exactly what we say about the mm -hmm. tales of Avi Nachman. Yes. Exactly. Just reading the stories bring about mm -hmm. a lot of bracha in the world, a lot of blessing. It's a very mystical concept, but we only know it through very special tzaddikim that reveal to us those types of secrets. So the story of Rabba Bar Barachana, as listed in Lesson 14 of Likute Maran, is as follows. And I'm just going to read it to you in English, because I don't want to do the part in, in Aramaic and the Kmara. So... It says over here, this is the meaning of what Rabbi Bar Barachana said. Okay? And we're going to go into the story right now. He says, a certain merchant told me. So it's not very long, but pay attention because otherwise you guys are going to miss something. A certain merchant told me, in quotation marks, come and I will show you where the earth and the heavens kiss. All right? Already very mystical. We're going to show you where the sky and the earth meets. I went and saw that there were many windows... I took my bread basket and placed it 
in the window of heaven after praying. I looked for it, but I couldn't find it. He asked, are there thieves here? And then they answered that the galgala of heaven has moved. Essentially, the, the windmill, the, the circular rotating device of heaven has moved. And he answered me, wait until tomorrow at this time and you will find it. Essentially, what he was saying is that there was a merchant that came and told him, come, I'm going to show you the place where the heavens and the earth meet. He said, that's not possible. He said, sure, I'll show it to you. So he took him somewhere. They got to a place. He put his bag in a window. He turned around and realized the bag was gone. When he realized the bag was gone, he said, where is it? Are there thieves here? He realized there was no one next to him. He told him, come back. Because what happened is that in the spheres in the upper worlds, this is the place where the heavens and the earth meet. It took your bag. But if you come back at the exact same time in the exact same spots tomorrow, the same alignment is going to happen and you're going to be able to find your bag. And he came back the next day and he found his bag. Okay? Do we understand any from, anything from this story? No. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> so we're going to actually see that this story is actually connected to the Parashah of the week. By the way, as a side note, whenever the Gemara says and whenever the story says of Rabba Baba Khana that there was a merchant, it's a reference to Eliyahu Nabi. Okay? So that's already a hidden secret within it. So it's Eliyahu Nabi that revealed himself to Rabba Baba Khana and said, come, I'm going to show you something. All right? So now we're going to get a little bit into the parasha and a little bit into the lesson. So Rabbi Nachman says, to be able to understand the story and to be able to understand the parasha, first you have to understand a concept. And he says that the concept is that the world, before I get into this, is everyone okay so far? Oh, yes. <clears throat> cool. So Rabbi Nachman says, there's a concept that the world and the foundation of the world is the letter Yud. The letter Yud. Yud. The letter Yud, the smallest letter. The reason why is because the Yud, you use the Yud to make everything else. Like the world was created with 10 sayings of God and used 10 different words, which are made up of letters. So too, every letter is made up using a Yud, if you think about it. All of them start off at the same point. And whenever you learn Safrut, whenever you learn the, the concepts and the education behind learning how to be a Sofer, like the people that write in Sefer Toaz, you'll learn that whenever you write properly, Everything is written within a perfect frame of a box, meaning that if you break up a box into three divisions and then three divisions, it almost forms nine perfect cubes. Mm -hmm. So every letter is built on a perfect structure of those cubes. So for example, Yud is just the first top cube in the top right. A Resh is the top and the bottom three. The Dalit also uses the same frame. Mm -hmm. And then the top uses that frame, but then adds the bottom bar on the third line. So to learn, when you learn Safrut, to learn how to space your letters properly, you learn how to space using this. But the point of why I'm bringing that up is to show you that a Yud is the smallest frame and it also is used in every single letter. It's found in every single letter. So he says, because the Yud is the foundation of the world, he says, understand that the Yud represents the heavens and the Yud represents the earth because it built everything. So he says, I'm going to start explaining the story now. He says, Rabba Rabba Khana called was called by Eliyahu Nabi and said, I'm going to show you a place where the heavens and the earth meet. So what is he saying? He's saying, I need to see a connection because normally speaking, the Yud up there and the Yud down there, they don't touch. He said, so how is there going to be a connection? So the connection is in the secret of the Vav, Rabbi Nachman says. Because the Vav is the concept of the Brit. It's the concept of the Tzaddik. But we're not going to do a whole lesson on the Vav. I'm just going to skip because we're not going to go into the whole lesson in the Kutimran. We're going to skip to showing something that makes the form of an Aleph. So what Rabbi Nachman is saying is that he was showing him the letter Aleph. Because if you have a Yud on the top, you have a Vav in the middle, and then you have a Yud on the bottom, it forms the letter Aleph. So Rabbi Nachman is saying over here, Rabbi Rabbi Khan is being approached by Elio Navi and he's telling him, come, I want to show you a place where the Yud and the Yud meet. But he's saying Yud and Yud don't meet. He's saying they only meet by way of Vav, Eliyahu Nabi Shohin. So he brings them to a place where it was. So Rabbi Bar Bachana is now telling him, I'm going to bring you to a place. You want to know where the place was? The place is the same place as where Yaakov Avinu slept in Israel, which is the place where we had the Akedah, where Avram brought Yitzchak. And it's the same place, Akedah is the sacrifice where he did the firstborn sacrifice, which we learned about a couple weeks ago. And it's the same place, not only where Yaakov had a dream and Avram sacrificed his son, it's also the place of the Kodesh HaGdashim in the Beit HaMikdash. 
All right. Well, Adam make the first uh, sacrifice. Yes. Exactly. It's on exactly Mount Moriah, Haramoria, for those that, that want to reference that. That's the name of the mountain. But let's go a little bit deeper. <laughs> We're, well, minute, that's, that's just the introduction. That's just the introduction. Is everyone okay with that so far? Mm-hmm. Yes. It's your sister. It's your aunt. My aunt, yeah. My dad's sister. It goes a lot deeper than that. Eliyahu Navi was showing Rabbi Barbachana. He was saying, the reason why I'm going to show you the Aleph is because Aleph is the name of Hashem. We call Hashem Aleph because we saw that there's the Yud, the Vav, and the Yud. And if you take the numerical value of it, it's 26. Exactly. There's Yud is 10. The bottom Yud is another 10 in numerical value. And the Vav is 6, which makes 26, which is the main name of Hashem, of Yud, He, Vav, and He, which also equals 26. So what Hashem was, what Eliyahu Navi was showing over here, Rabbi Babachana, is I'm going to show you the letter Aleph and the concept of the letter Aleph. Now, one minute, we're going to go a little bit deeper. He's saying over here, further, whenever you connect it to the parasha, like we learned and we learned a couple weeks ago as well, we learned the concept of a tzibur last week. Do you guys remember that? Yes. So the tzibur, we talked about in a gemara. The gemara brings up the word tzibur. A tzibur is like a congregation. It's a community of people that come collectively to pray. And it says the tzibur is written with the letters tzaddik, beit, and resh, for those that were there. And it stands for the rashi tevot, which is the first letters of each word, which is tzaddik, benoni, and rasha. So it says that the perfect unification of prayer happens whenever you have tzaddikim, righteous people, regular normal people, benonim, the people that are kind of like the average Joe, and then the rasha, the people that are the evildoers. And this brings Hashem the most pleasure in the world. So we understand the concept of the tzibur from last week. We understand the concept that it brings joy to Hashem to see this. We're seeing that there's a yud and a yud below, and it's connected by a vav. And now what actually Rabbi Barbachan is saying is he's being called by Elon Abiy, and Elon Abiy is saying, I want to show you something. I want to show you where the heavens and the earth kiss. I want to show you where the upper Yud, which references the Tzaddik, and the lower Yud, which references the Rasha, meet. Now, Rabbi Barbachana says, that doesn't make any sense. How is it that Tzaddikim and Reshaim, good people and bad people, have the same place? The Tzaddikim are up in heaven, they attain their place, they achieve their goals, they have the things that they earn their place, and the Rashaim are down on earth because they don't achieve anything of, of special worth. So how is it that they could meet? Because their levels are not the same. He said there's a special place, and there's a place of connection that's brought about through the Vav, which we're going to learn about through the dream of Yaakov. And he says what? He says that's the form of the letter Aleph. The letter Aleph is whenever Hashem says to Essentially, Rabbi Barbachana through Eliyahu Navi is I'm going to teach you that for me, the Yud up there and the Yud down there are the same. A Tzaddik and a Rasha to me is the same. All they need is a connection to be able to bring themselves together. And all of it can be brought about by the ability of learning through the letter Aleph. Alright? So we're going to get a little bit deeper into it. If you go back into the parasha and we see the dream... It starts off with the word, this is going to be the first answer to some of the questions we had. The Pasha starts off with the word Vayetze. Vayetze is written with the letters Vav, Yud, Sadek, Aleph. Right? It's for Rashi Tevot, Vayera, Yaakov, Tzurat, Aleph. And Yaakov saw the letter Aleph. Wow, 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 wow. Okay. I'm going to repeat it. Surah is, is the image. As the image. So when Yaakov saw that the heaven is meeting the earth by a ladder that's on a slant, that's connecting the two, it's connecting the concept of the upper world and the lower world. And Rabbi Nachman is saying this is the secret behind the story of Rabbi Rabbi Hana, That he's seen the letter Aleph. Why? Because Yaakov at this point, now we're going to go back to the parasha. All right. Keep in mind, we have the concept of the tzibur. We have the concept that Hashem loves whenever we unite and we pray all together because we don't judge people. Okay? 
The letter Aleph is the representation of Hashem because the Aleph is 26, which is also 26 of Hashem. We have this story where he's going to see the connection of the Tzaddik and the Rasha and to see how it appears in front of Hashem. And now we're going to see his dream. All right. So now back to the parasha, we see that Yaakov leaves and he goes to go get strength. Essentially, he goes to the yeshiva and Shemin era because when we put ourselves in the shoes of Yaakov, remember he got a little bit depressed. He hadn't seen and communicated with Hashem, his forefathers had. A lot of things happened to him. So when his mom says, between Esa, between Lavan, he's kind of distraught. He doesn't know what to do. It's kind of confusing for him. But he says his mom knows best. His mom knows best. His mom has Ruach HaKodesh. Rivka had. And I'm going to trust her, so I'm going to go to Lavan. But before I go to Lavan, I have to go learn Torah and I have to prepare myself. Because Lavan is such a big rasha, he went to learn in the Yeshiva of Shem and Eber for 14 years. The 14 years mystically, okay, the 14 years he didn't sleep. He learned straight. The reason why is because when a person does an action, let's say we do a mitzvah, or let's say we learn Torah tonight for like 30 minutes or an hour. You have the accomplishment of a task for one hour. But if we take breaks in between, or if a person goes to work and does lunch, then it's like for an hour in between, then it's like you worked four hours and then you worked four hours, right? Makes sense. Yaakov needed so much strength to combat the evil forces of Lavan that he needed 14 years straight without any breaks in between. That's the amount of spiritual energy that he gained and that he developed over those 14 years. Mystically also, he compiled the 14 shiramalot that we read in Tehilim. <clears throat> David HaMelech eventually recomposed and put into the Tehilim these shiramalot, but they were originally composed from Yaakov Avinu during these 14 years. Each year, a new shiramalot. Okay? We know that Tehilim, by the way, even though it's all compiled by David, different Tehilim come from different people. There's Tehilim written by Abraham Avinu, Yaakov Avinu, Moshe Rabbeinu, Adam Arishon. The son of Korach. Yeah, sons of Korach. <laughs> exactly. So all of them are, are very significant. Um, is that all clear? <laughs> Everyone good on all of that? So the 14 years signify a lot of significance that he's preparing himself with Torah. But now keep in mind that he still hasn't been revealed Hashem yet. So he prepares himself, he prepares himself, he prepares himself. He has Ruach HaKodesh to a certain degree, but he's not revealed Hashem. And he doesn't know if he's done something right. At this point, after 14 years, he's going to Lavan and he gets a little depressed. Before he even gets to Lavan, Esav had wanted to originally kill him. But he decided not to kill him until his father passed away for Kibbut Avayim. But he sent his son Eliphaz. Respect of parents. Yeah, Kibbut Avayim is, is exactly honoring your father and mother. So he sent his son Eliphaz and commanded him to go kill Yaakov. Esav did it because he didn't want to do it in front of his father. And Eliphaz was torn because Eliphaz was the son of Esav, but he learned with Yaakov. He was like, even though it was his nephew, they were very close and they were friends and he taught him Torah. So he didn't know between fathering his mother, keeping his you know, father happy and doing what his father said. But at the same time, Yaakov was his teacher a little bit. So there was a tear over there between the Torah and the Mitrash and everything. So when he sees Yaakov exiting the Yeshiva of Shebenever, he tells him, my father sent me to kill you, but I don't know what to do. So Yaakov said, it's simple. In the Gemara and in the Halakha, it says that if you take all of a person's wealth, it's as if they're dead. So let me give you all of my money. So Rivka, when she gave Yaakov money before he went to Lavan, he had all the wealth in the world because the Yitzchak was very wealthy and Avram was very wealthy. But now Yaakov... As you can see, the depression is building up because Hashem's not helping him. You have someone coming to kill him. He's going to Lavan. He doesn't have any answers from Hashem and any response to what he needs to do. He's gone from the tzaddik because he's not next to Yitzhak. He can't study Torah because now he's going into exile, in a form of exile. And now he gets to the point where he's really thinking to himself, my parents, when they were tested, when Yitzhak was tested after the Akedah, Abimelech gave him a lot of money. When Avraham was tested and he was thrown in the fire and, and Abimelech and the story with the wife and Sarah, when Sarah was kidnapped... Um, from Avram Avinu by Paro, he was then returned with lots of money. So he said, my parents received lots of money when they were tested, but I don't get anything. So he kept on thinking, maybe I did something wrong. Maybe Yitzhak should have actually blessed Esav. Actually, he's ruined. Yeah. So he's literally left completely naked, essentially, with nothing left, and he has nothing to do. So he almost kind of drops his hands at this point. And when he gets to this place, 
something very special happens. Rashi says that Hashem lets the sun, su the sun set early and it turns to night. And it says Yaakov goes to sleep. But keep in mind, mystically, Yaakov hasn't slept in 14 years. So fasting, as an example, if a person fasts for one day, but then they fast every single Monday, after some time, it gets a little bit easier, right? So then it becomes very easy to fast every Monday. It almost becomes habit after one year, two years, three years, five years. So to then eat again on Monday is kind of like it's almost breaking habits. So Yaakov didn't sleep. He didn't need to sleep. That's the level of spirituality that he had. So to sleep was actually a huge miracle for him. Because to lower himself to that level. Mm -hmm. What Rabbi Nachman says over here is that we learn one of the most powerful things over here from the parasha, that the thing that's the most simple thing that he just went to sleep is one of the most powerful movements that ever happened in the history of the Jewish people. And that's what inherited the dream and the revelation of Hashem. Because Yaakov Avinu did the following. Yaakov Avinu had Ruach HaKodesh. So when he got to this location and the sun was setting, there's a symbolism of whenever we saw that last week's parasha, Yaakov Esav shed two tears. He shed two tears because he saw the destruction of the two temples. Those two tears that Esav shed when he didn't get the bracha caused the destruction of the two temples. When Yaakov came to the place where the temples were built, he saw the destruction of the two temples. So he fell into depression. That's the darkness that he fell into. And then when he saw that, he said to himself, because Hashem reveals in certain visions, we know from the Kabbalah, that some things are revealed, some things are not revealed. So Yaakov gets to this place and he has his hands down because he doesn't have Hashem, like we said, he doesn't have the tzad, he's doing, he doesn't have his money, he doesn't have anything, and he sees the destruction of the temples. But he does what? He starts to dig a little deep. And he starts to do what? He says to himself, I'm going to lower myself. And this is the first time we see in the Torah, in a very, very mystical way, that the tzaddik lowers himself into the concept of death, into the concept of exile, just for the sake of the people to remind them that he's there when they're suffering. So Yaakov said, I see my children that are going to suffer a thousand years from now. And they're going to be destroyed. And there's going to be blood in the streets of Jerusalem. And the temples are going to be destroyed. I'm going to go to sleep right now. I'm going to break all the holiness and all the thought that I had, that I, that I thought that I had. And I'm going to go to sleep, which the Gemara says is a 60th of death. And I'm going to enter into the concept of dreams, which is the concept of Nebuah, which is foresight. And in that moment, he lowered himself so much to the level of every single person in Bnei Israel that was suffering in the future generation. He says, I'm going to live with them and I'm going to suffer with them like that. Hashem said, now I'm going to reveal myself to Yaakov. And then he brought him a dream. And in the dream, he revealed to him the letter Aleph. And what was the lesson of the letter Aleph as we learned by Rabbi Babachana? He told him, he says, even if you're feeling low, even if you're the lower Yud, I want you to understand that the Yud on the bottom and the Yud on the top is the same. Why? Because angels go up and down. There are angels that are going up and there's angels that are going down. That's why it starts off in the Pasha and it says that the angels were going up. Mm -hmm. Meaning that the angels, isn't it normal that the angels come down first because they're up there? I said no. Because you are starting from the bottom. He said so too even angels that they come up and down also they can go up. And that's why it's a Yud on the bottom and the Yud on the top because the Yud is the same. So you tell them, I want you to understand the letter Aleph. And that's why it says that he saw, Vayetzeh, and is the acronym for he saw the letter Aleph. And this is what gave him now the energy to now see Hashem and to now see the way Hashem works. To reveal himself that Hashem sees a person that is a sinner and a person that is a tzaddik the exact same way. It's a novelty because essentially what he's saying over here is that, and Rabbi Nachman reveals this actually in Lesson 78 of Book 2, is when on Shabbat Nachamu, Rabbi Nachman himself fell into a depression. And the students of Rabbi Nachman, I'm not going to say the whole story, but in that lesson, that's the lesson where Rabbi Nachman reveals the saying, En Yehush Ba'olam Klal. He says, there's no worry in the world at all. There's nothing to be depressed about. Why? Because Hashem is with you down here, and Hashem is with you up there. When you're depressed, Hashem is with you. And when you're feeling high and you're doing Torah Mitzvot, Hashem is with you too. And he says, all of it is done about through the connection of the tzaddik. And all of it is done through the connection of seeing the letter Aleph, seeing Hashem. All this is being revealed to Yaakov through the dreams. All right? And essentially what he's saying over here is that the whole concept of the tzaddik and the rasha was actually misinterpreted for thousands of years. We grow up and we go to Jewish schools or we go to temple and we hear rabbis speak and they talk so negatively about rashaim. And they talk so positively about tzaddikim. And granted, we're not talking about people that, that sin purposefully and people that are trying to degrade the name of Hashem in any type of way over here. There's no, 
hint over here to say that people should do sins or do anything bad, God forbid. But the point is that to Hashem, because Hashem only sees good and Hashem only reveals good, the difference between a tzaddik and a rasha, a person that's righteous and a person that fails and a person that sins, is the moment of something that happens. But sometimes people get overwhelmed. It's normal. It says even that in, in, um, in the book of Pierre um, Keavot, it talks about how a tzaddik can fall seven times. Or it talks also in the books of Shmuel, uh, of Shlomo Amelach, about how a tzaddik falls seven times. Right? So the concept is that when a tzaddik falls, he also gets back up. So there's Yeridot, which is the concept of descents that happen also to tzaddikim. So it's a beautiful concept because what he's saying over here is that understand that no matter how far you go down, Hashem is also there. And the reason why Hashem only sees good is because as you go up in the worlds, in the Kabbalistic worlds, you go up through the levels of Asiya, which is the world that we are in, which is the world of action. You go up to the next level, which is the world of Yetzirah, which is the world of formation. It's the level where there's mostly a lot of angels and other creations, other different types of angels and other types of creations of God. Then there's the third world up, which is the level of Beria, which is the world of creation. It's the level where there's the Kisea Kavot, where there's this throne of Hashem, is on that level. And all the root of the souls of Bnei Israel are rooted from that level of that third world. And then above that, there's the level of Atsilut. Atsilut is essentially the, the highest level that can be referenced um, in connection with the soul and that people can attain. The other levels above that are levels that are unattainable by basic uh, human life on this earth that we cannot attain. It's, it's essentially only attainable through death. And, and the world above that, just for people's reference, is a world called Adam Kadmon, which is primordial man. It's the image of man, but it's not a man. It's, it's only God. On that level, it's perfection of God. It's the energy of God. And above that, essentially, is the Insof, which is the infiniteness of God, which we don't understand. That's the concept that we cannot understand. It's before the creation of the world. It's before the, the creation of energy to bring down to be able to get into our world. So that was a little bit of background in mystical Kabbalah. But the reason why I brought it is because as in reference over here to the lessons, and as in reference over here, as you go up in the levels, you go up to the level of eventually Atsilut, which is only the Ratzon of Hashem. Ratzon in Hebrew is will. When you get to the level of the highest levels of the will of God, it is only the intention of God looking at how you intended to do something. It has nothing to do with the action because action is applicable to the world of action. But because you're referencing God on an upper world, it's only reference to the way God views your act, views your thought and your intentions behind this. So if a person, this is very, very mystical, but just to be able to get into the depth of it, when a person does something, a person can do an act that could be a sin and didn't mean to sin but fell because he had a moment of weakness, but he wants to get close to Hashem and he found his weakness and he says to Hashem, I'm sorry for what I did and everything he does is try to get close to God. His will up there, God only sees good. He doesn't see the sin. But down here, we see sin. And that's the difference of how people differentiate Rishayim and Tzadikim. But up there, Hashem only sees good. And that's the beauty of what he's trying to show him in the secrets over here, Eleon Avi to Rabbi Barachana. And what Yaakov Avinu is seeing is he's saying, I see you that you feel depressed, that you feel like I haven't been revealed to you, that you feel like a sap should have gotten the bracha, but you're wrong because you're going to bring about the redemption. And I want you to know that I'm going to show you this through the letter Aleph. And I'm going to show you that through the depths of your despair, I'm going to bring about the redemption. And just because Yaakov said, I'm going to go into that darkness and I'm going to sleep even though I shouldn't sleep because I need to gain my strength. So too, and just as you created the break, I will also bring about the redemption through you. And after that, Yaakov gains the strength to be able to now go to Lavan. All right? But before he goes to Lavan, I want to read you guys a little bit into the secrets of the parasha. By the way, that was, that was one of the layers deep, but we're going to go a little bit deeper. I hope that's okay. <laughs> yeah. So in, in the words in the... We can hear me? Yeah. Il avait besoin d'aller à Lavan. He needed to go to see Lavan because. Yeah, Lavan. The reason why he had to go to Lavan is he knew he had to go to Lavan because he understood that he had to go get his wife from there. He knew that Lea and Rachel, Kabbalistically, were in the house of Lavan, so he had to go there. So he knew he had to go there, but the depression was: How do you find Hashem? 
But it's actually beautiful that you brought up that question, Jordan, because it actually brought up a point that I forgot. The letter Aleph was showing Yaakov, he's saying, you think that you could not find me in the house of Yaakov when Esav is trying to kill you. You think you cannot find me outside, right? And Yaakov is saying to Hashem, I don't see you in the world. And why don't I see you? Because Yaakov thinks that he can only find Hashem if he studies Torah, if he does mitzvot, if he's like a tzaddik. Think about tzaddikim today. They sit down, they study Torah, they, don't, they only do good things, right? But we, Rabbi Nachman flips this whole concept on his head. He says, you don't understand the concept of the tzaddik. He says, go a little bit deeper. He says, Yaakov is being revealed by Hashem now the dream and now he's ready to go see Lavan. Why is he now getting up and now he says, this is the place of Hashem and now I'm going to go see Lavan. And then he has the strength and he moves the rock off the well and he sees Rachel and he does all this stuff. Why is he doing all this? Because Hashem just revealed to him through the Aleph. He says, if you think that I'm only found in the Beit Midrash, you're wrong. I'm found next to the Reshaim too. I'm found on the lowest level. So he says, you can find me in the house of Lavan too. And then when he sees that, he says, I'm ready to go now to Lavan. He says, because now I can be with Hashem and I can defeat everyone. Because now Yaakov understood, now he's going to find Hashem even in the darkness of the world. So Yaakov was a Breslev. Yeah. <laughs> that was one. Huh? The first one. Yeah. No, uh, you know, Rabbi Nachman says in his books, he says that my Torah is so old. He says that you forgot it. He says it's the Torah of the Avot. These lessons and these parshiot, these classes that we've been doing, there's a lot of amazing secrets in them. We're only doing some of them. But... It's going to eventually run out because we're going to get eventually to the, the Sefer Mitzrayim, obviously the books of Shemot and the story of Mitzrayim and, and the exile of the Jews and stuff. It's amazing as well. But the thing about the stories of the Avot and the stories that we're learning now about Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov and the Imaot, right, of Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Nea are very amazing. So the things that we're receiving right now are very, very special. So that's why it's very important to understand that the Torah that Rabbi Nachman is bringing down is a Torah that the Avot were doing. And this is the Torah as they are learning it. This is the Torah that they're understanding. And this is what Rabbi Nachman is teaching us. The Torah that we never understood, that we never thought we would learn. It's in the hidden lines within the Torah and the Pasha. So before he goes to Lavan, I'm going to read to you from over here. He essentially says that this is the place of Hashem. Hashem blesses him just as he does. I'll read to you a little bit of the English and a little bit of the Hebrew so you guys get a little bit of the Pasha. This is literally in the first, the first few psukim. Okay, in the first few passages that are in the very opening of the Pasha. And he says... Um, I'll read it to you really quickly in Hebrew. And he got out of Be'er Sheva and he goes towards Haran. Um, and he takes these stones from this place and he puts it under his head. And then he dreamed that there was a sulam, that there was a ladder um, that was kind of going upwards on an angle to um, that was going to the heavens. And angels are going up and going down. And over here he sees... Um, that Hashem reveals himself and he, and he blesses him like he did to Avram and Yitzchak. Um, and then he goes through the words like, Asher shochev kafar, like that I was going to give an inheritance to your future generations. Uh, yame kadev, uh, ve tzafon and he's talking about the different directions of the world and he's going to bless them and his families and the earth and everything that he touches. And Hashem finally reveals himself after the dream to Yaakov and he's giving him the blessings like he did to his father. So now Yaakov is getting all this energy because he sees the Aleph, he sees the lesson, he's seeing Hashem's with him, he's getting ready to go to Lavan and he's getting blessed. But there's still the other question, which is a little bit weird, which is why does he say now, um, and this is the place of Hashem after he's blessed, like, I mean, borderline Yaakov sees Hashem in everything that he does, right? After, especially after the prophecy. So why is he like, now I see Hashem, now Hashem is revealed to me and I didn't know, it says, Van like, and I didn't see so what's the whole deal with that? Does he not just see Hashem, Hashem not reveal himself to him? And does Yaakov already on the level of Ruach HaKodesh and the traveling and learning for 14 years and all the Kabbalah that he understood, does he not see Hashem everywhere he goes? And he's talking about Hashem's never going to leave him and he's never going to leave them. Like it's a, conf it's a reference also to the Beit HaMikdash and Yaakov. Et asher dibartilech. And then it says over here, Vayikatz Yaakov and Yaakov got up. He woke rapidly from his sleep. Mishnato, which is his sleep. Vayomer, achen yesh Hashem bamakom azeh. There's Yudke Vavke, there's Hashem in this place. Ve'anochi lo yadati. And I didn't see, I didn't know. 
that's where I'm going to stop. There's a couple more psukim, but it's essentially 20 psukim, 20 passages for the first parts, the Hishon, the first, the seven readings that we read. And that's the whole story. All right? So we're now we're going to focus on the end part of that. If you look at the word of when he got up, it's vayiketz, right? Vayiketz, sorry. If you look at the spelling of vayiketz, it's vav yud yud kuf tzadik. You have, in the beginning of the parasha, when he's going with his hands down and he's depressed and he doesn't see Hashem, vayetze, there's vav yud, there's only one yud in the vav. Why? Because the story of Rabbi Baba Khana, what happens? He said that there's a yud up there and a yud down here. He says they don't meet. He says, how is it possible? I understand the concept of the tzaddik. I understand the concept of the connection. I understand the upper yud. He said, but how are you going to tell me that Hashem speaks also to the Rashaim? How is it that Hashem also finds favor in the, in the Rashaim? When he wakes up, vayiketz. You don't need to use the word vayiketz to wake up. You can use lots of other different things. He specifically uses this word in the Torah. Because it's showing us two yuds in a vav. Because now he wakes up with the understanding of the letter Aleph. That's a secret over here. Wow, wow. You like that? Mm. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> we're going to go a little bit deeper. This is one of the only classes where I'm going to tell you we're going to go deeper, we're going to go deeper, we're going to... Don't get used to it. <laughs> so, to understand this a little bit more, Rabbi Nachman says, you have to understand Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. So Avraham, we know, was the morning. Yitzchak was the afternoon and, and Yaakov was the evening. That's why Avram prepared the tefillah of Shacharit. He prepared the prayer of Shacharit. Um, Yitzchak prepared the tefillah of Mincha. And Yaakov prepared the prayer of the evening. According to the Kabbalah, the reason why the evening prayer is very mystically important, it's very special, is because it's a point where the evil forces come into the world. I'm not going to get too much into it. Um, but what happens is, is that... Um, what you're doing is you're entering into darkness, and it's the story of Yaakov that we see over here with the dream, is that night befell him, he fell into depression, and he found a way to worship Hashem. And he went into the depths of despair of the future people. He put himself at the level of Bnei Yisrael in the sin and their destruction of the temple in many years. When you do Arvit, one of the marshavot, one of the meditations you can have when you do Arvit, is that in the darkness of the night, you're choosing to find Hashem, you're choosing to see the letter Aleph. And that's one of the meditations behind it the whole prayer of Arfit, which is very special, which is why it's the only prayer we do at night. There's other prayers that we do, but this is one of the main instituted prayers. When you say Arvit, sorry, I missed it. Arvit uh, is no, the... No, no, I missed <coughs> the part. Or you say when you are in darkness yourself, or it's not necessarily referring to that prayer, that you don't... That yes, you're, you're in darkness. of course, that's finding the Aleph. We'll get back into that in a little bit. So Rabbi Nachman says further, he says that Avraham represents the first temple. Yitzchak represents the second temple, and Yaakov represents the third temple. <coughs> okay? And Yaakov and Avram, we know, worshipped Hashem in the mountains. The mountains are a very elevated place. Very few people make their way up to the mountains, and even dwell in the mountains and live in the mountains. Yitzchak found Hashem in the field. The field is already more accessible for people, but it's still distant because it's secluded and people don't really always occupy there. And Yaakov found Hashem in the house. It's household. It's that anyone can attain it. Everybody has a house. Everybody finds Hashem. And that's also the concept of the Aleph. Is that the level of the Aleph that Hashem had been revealing to Avram that he was not able to reveal and bring into the world was a Torah that was very, very elevated that few people could understand. It's the level of Tzadikim. It's the upper Yud. Yitzchak is the same thing. Because very few people have the ability to go seclude themselves and go into the forest and go find Hashem and even in those dark moments and have that seclusion. But Yaakov, Yaakov goes into the darkness. Yaakov goes into the night and Yaakov brings it down to the lowest level. And that's why when Yaakov gets to the place before he has his dream, he has Ruach HaKodesh and he sees two temples. But he doesn't see the third temple because he's depressed. He doesn't see that there's a connection. He doesn't see that Hashem pulls you out from despair because he doesn't see the connection yet between the upper Yud and the lower Yud. So he starts to cry and he falls into depression. But he says, I'm going to still go into that darkness. And he falls into it. And he goes to sleep. And then when Hashem reveals to him, he sees what? He sees the third temple that Hashem is never going to leave Bnei Yisrael in the future, that He's going to be with them through every single piece of darkness. And when Hashem saw that in her entity, Yaakov, Yaakov had the ratzon of entering into that space where He will never leave the Jewish people in the future, so to Hashem says, I will never leave you too. And then He blesses them that I will be with you for every single generation and every single thing that happens. 
So, after that, I'm going to end with a couple last things over here. We're almost done. There's a midrash that's brought down. And this is still part of the depth that we're going into because we're swimming in deep waters. There's a midrash that's brought down, sorry, that says that when Yitzchak gave the bracha to Yaakov, Yaakov had some ruach HaKodesh in the room and it was revealed to him the kisei HaKavod of Hashem. All right? And the kisei HaKavod of Hashem, as I said a little bit earlier, is on the level of Beria. It's in the world, the third world up, which is the world of where Hashem's glory is. As a little bit of a reference, I didn't get a chance to, to check this out in the book, in the Midrash, in the reference for this, but if you guys want to take my word for it, um, we can fact check it another time. It says that the world of Bria, just to give this in reference, because there is a concept of time and space in the upper worlds, but it's m much less understood by the physics of this world, because we're talking about um, non-physical items with physical items. It's a little bit mathematical, um, and physics related and scientific related, but just so that people understand the magnitude of what this is, it says in the Midrash that the world of Beria is three times 500 light years long. I did the math on it because I had to find a bunch of different calculators to try to figure it out. And it essentially comes out that if you're traveling at the, sp at the speed of an average aircraft, like an average plane, it would take you about 50 million years at 500 miles an hour to go across the world of Beria, if it was physically possible, if you were on a physical level. That's just a little bit into the mystic behind it, just to show you how infinite and how grandiose all of the, of the Torah and the expansion of Hashem is. In the Midrash, it says that when Yaakov entered into the world of Bria and saw the Kisei HaKavod of Hashem, and he saw the throne of glory of God, there's four legs to the throne of the Kisei HaKavod of Hashem. And on each leg is engraved something. So on one leg is engraved a man. On one leg is engraved a cherub, which is, it's a hybrid of an angel and the body of an ox and a baby angel and, uh, and wings of a bird. So it's, it's a mix, um, but that's one of the faces. It's a cherub, it's a special angel of God. The, in Hebrew, it's called Keruvim, Kruvim. And the Kruvim were also on top of the ark that Moshe Rabbeinu had in the Kodesh Akdashim. Okay? So, this is being revealed to Yaakov. He sees a man. He sees Kruvim, the image of this angel. He sees a lion. And he sees an eagle. Okay? And in the Midrash, it says that he doesn't recognize the man on the bottom of the Kisei Kabot. We understand this so far? All right. Now let's go back to the parasha. That's Yaakov. He doesn't recognize He doesn't him. recognize the man in the Ruach HaKodesh in the Midrash. Hashem reveals to him, like he said, he saw the two temples, but he didn't see the third temple, so he falls into depression. Sometimes Hashem reveals to him things, but he doesn't reveal the full picture. We have this in the concept of prophecy, in the concept of dreams. Just as a little idea for people that are interested in dreams and prophecy, um, there's different Gemarot and different books of Kabbalah that talk about it, but for those that are interested, dreams are essentially broken down into four main categories. There's no dreaming, essentially uh, nonsense, right? Like that person is just not having any sort of connection. There's dreams that mean nothing, that are just pointless images, that it's just kind of a delusion. There's dreams that are holy and pure, that have true prophecy in them, can be interpreted, cannot be interpreted. Sometimes people can interpret them, sometimes people cannot. But there are ones that have interpretation and that have real prophecy. And then there are dreams that come from the side of darkness that are, that are essentially things that can be done by negative energy and negative forces in the world. It's almost like the prophecy on the negative side. Okay? So that's part of understanding how to interpret dreams and part of that type of stuff. But when he's having this dream and he wakes up, look at the words that's being used in the parasha, which is absolutely amazing. It says, Vayiketz, Vayikatz, Yaakov, as he wakes up, Mishnato, from his sleep, Vayomer, Achen, Yesh Hashem Bama Remember, we were asking the question, why does he see Hashem here? Why not? Like, why does he not see Hashem in general? And why does he not recognize? It says, Achen, right? Behold. And, it's, and all these words that are being used are very bizarre, like the Vayitse, like we said, but Vayikats. And then we eventually explained that there's two Yuds in one and one Yud in the other. And it says over here, how awesome is this place? Bama Komaze, Kianochi Yadati. Vayanochi Lo Yadati, sorry. And it says that, um, and I didn't recognize. 
that I didn't see and I didn't know. Okay? Translations are loose over here, but for those that understand Hebrew a little bit more, loyadati is like I didn't know, I didn't understand, I didn't see, I didn't, under, I didn't understand what was going on. If you look at the words over here, look at the secret Rabbi Nachman is trying to show us over here from the Midrash. He's saying, if you look at the word achen, after he wakes up from the dream, achen yes, yes Hashem ba makom I see Hashem now in this. Uh, there is Hashem in this place. Achen is Aleph, Chet, Nun. Aleph is Ari, oh, sorry, Chaf. Aleph is Arye, Chef is Kruv, Nun is Nesher, which is Ego. Achen yesh Hashem ba makom there is Hashem in this place because I see His kisei akavod. I see His glory. Haze, right? As we said, ve'anochi lo yadati, but me, I didn't know, because Yaakov is the man and the image of Yaakov that's on the fourth seat of the throne. That's the man. Ve'anochi lo yadati. It's not that I didn't see that Hashem was here. It's not that. So there's multiple levels to understanding the pasuk. Yaakov says first. Right? I'm going to take it back a step so that everyone understands. We first said, what's the deal with the place? Why is, Hashem, why is Yaakov not seeing the location of the place? And why is he not understanding Hashem's glory is there? I'm going to take it back slowly so that everyone understands it. All right? First level is the Beit HaMikdash and the place of the Akedah, which we learned from Rashi, which is already a very deep understanding that this is the place where they did the Akedah and the Beit HaMikdash is going to be here. That's why he sees the prophecy of the temples. So now he says this is the place of Hashem. This is Beit El. He calls the place Beit El. Oh, it's funny, I was talking with Rabbi Moshe about this because mm-hmm. he opened up Beit El in the parasha when yeah. Yaakov goes to Beit El, right? So, um, either way, he gets to this place, right? The first layer is, it's the place of the Beit Amidash, where he sees Hashem. Then you go a little bit deeper, you learn about the Aleph. And the Aleph will go very deep, obviously, because the Aleph is connected over here. And he says what? I see Hashem here, I see Hashem is even willing to go down into the darkest places. Hashem is going to be with us in the destruction of the temple. By the way, Yaakov, remember we learned last week that how did Yaakov get the bracha from Yitzchak? He came in with the clothing of what? The Kohen Gadol. What does Yaakov grab according to the Kabbalah over here? The Zohar talks about this in the beginning of the Excuse Pasha. Me. I didn't did want... really come with the Kohen Gadol? Yet? It's a reference over there to the, to the Begad of the Kohen Gadol. It's the clothing of Esav. It's the clothing of Esav the that was skin, brought down. The skin. The skin. It has different animal hides and, and it had hair and nails in it. But it was very mystical because it was built by Hashem, that piece of clothing. But it's a reference to the Kohen Gadol because the Kohen Gadol, which is the connection between Hashem in this world, is the same thing as a tzaddik. The connection between Hashem in this world. So the Kohen Gadol, when we don't have Kohen Gadol, the tzaddik replaces. That's why the tzaddik and the Kohen Gadol are the same. There's a lot of deep mystical stories about that and how Rabbi Nachman says that whenever you do the Ketoret, we talked about the Ketoret, which is the incense that's brought in the temple, which is only brought by the Kohen Gadol, so too you can do the same thing by doing Azamra. What did we talk about last week? We said that it's finding the darkness in people and doing finding the good in them. It's the eleven incense that's brought about, which is the holiest thing that Hashem loves the most, that's brought in the holiest place in the temple, is what? It has ten good spices and one bad spice. And here Yaakov, he says... There's the upper yud that also connects with the lower yud. And he's learning all this stuff over and over again. He's seeing all the depth of all of this. What does it say that he finds when he gets to this place? Twelve special stones. What are the twelve special stones that the Kohen Gadol wears on his chest? It's from the Choshen Mishpat. Each stone represents one of the tribes. So what does he do? He gets to this place and he starts already preparing Kabbalistically the 12 sons that he's going to have, the tribes, wow. which is the preparation of the clothing that he had when he received his bracha, which is the preparation of how he's coming now as the Kohen Gadol in front of Hashem to receive this bracha. All right? So now what does he say? He says, Achen, the Arye, the Kuv, and the Nesher, the Lion, the Cherub, and the, and the Eagle, the Anochi, how do you spell Anochi? Aleph, Nun, Chet, but there's a Yud. Yud is Yaakov. Ve'anochi lo yadati. And I didn't see. So aside from the fact that Hashem is with us in the depths, He's saying it now, now I can finally see that I am on the Kisei HaKavod Hashem. Wow. And that Hashem is destined to bring the generations out through me. And now He has the strength to go to Lavan. Wow. That's why He knew that He had to have 12. 
That's why he knew he had to have a Torah. Tribes, and that's why he went out and he went and he eventually, after that, he sees Leah, Rachel. There's a lot of very deep stories. <laughs> I'll end, I'm going to end with, with just a couple points to bring it down a little bit to practicality. Already, whenever we talk about a lot of mystical things, I said this kind of, I hinted at this a little bit in the beginning of the class, but like I said, you know, when I, when I was talking about the concept of Rabbanim and, and uh, Reshaim, Sadikim, stuff like that, I don't want people to think that, you know, to sit down for a class of Torah, it's not for the point of essentially sitting down and just learning Torah and we just learn some words and, and that's really it with it, you know. One of the very few special people that had the ability to take Torah down from the highest levels of the upper Yud down to the lower Yud was Rabbi Nachman of Breslev. This whole lesson, we brought the depths of the secrets of the Kabbalah from Rabbi um, Rabbi Barbachana in the times of the Kemara. We brought examples of the Zohar, the Midrash, and it's incredibly applicable to the world today. The two main lessons, two of the main lessons that Rabbi Nachman brought into the world, if you look at them, it's the lesson of Azamra, which we talked about last week, and Ayeh. Both of them specifically start with the letter Aleph. It's not by chance, because both of those lessons, Azamcha is I'm going to sing to Hashem with my little bit. It's a quote from Tehilim. I'm going to sing to Hashem with the little bit of good that I have. I'm going to find a little bit of good in myself and in every single person, and that's going to bring about the salvation. Just as Yaakov was able to go into the darkness and find a little bit of good and protect the Bnei Israel. Ayeh is the lesson wherever you say, where are you, Hashem? Searching for Hashem. All of the Avot did this. All of the Avot said, where are you, Hashem? Avraham went into the fire. He went searching. He had, there was the idol worship. And everything he did was to search and seek and find out Hashem. Yaakov had the same thing. He goes, learns for 14 years, studies in the house of Torah. He says, Hashem, I understand your upper yud, but I don't understand the concept of the lower yud. I mean, he didn't understand it, but he's revealed now the letter, Vayetze, Vayira, Yaakov, Tzura Aleph. And he sees the letter Aleph, and now he understands all this, and now he's revealed all of this Torah. The point of all of it is to tell us that the concept of the Tzibur and the concept of the Tzadikim is to show us that you see Reshaim, or you see people that don't do Torah mitzvot, and I'm going to keep on banging this in every single class because it's always going to be connected, because this is the highest point and, the, and also the deepest point that will be brought in every single parasha. The point is that there is no, a person is a, person is a Tzadik or a person is not a Tzadik. This is why Rabbi Nachman revealed this lesson to Rabbi Nathan. It was the first lesson he taught Rabbi Nathan. It's in lesson six of Likute Maran. Lesson six of Likute Maran, Rabbi Nachman talks about what? Baki Barotze ve Baki Bashov. He talks about being an expert in running and returning. What is the running and returning? It's where he reveals the letter Aleph. He says, go up and you go down. He says, you think that you're close to Hashem whenever you're starting to run and you're going, oh, I'm doing great, I'm doing mitzvot, I go to classes of Torah, I'm feeling good, I'm learning a little bit of this, I have a good thought, I give tztaka. So you think you're doing good. He says, no, Hashem is also with you in the depths. Hisham is also with you in the darkness. That's where he reveals the letter Aleph. And he shows this to Rabbi Natan. The second Rabbi Natan is his main follower. He tells Rabbi Natan to be and understand and to, because Rabbi Nachman knew that Rabbi Natan was going to be through prophecy, his main follower. He said, I'm going to show you the whole crux of all my teachings, that there is no despair, that Hashem is with you doing everything. And I want you to understand all this so that you can understand all my Torah. A couple chidushim that I realized that Hashem, I, I guess, really essentially gifted me when I was reading this. This lesson in the lesson of Aleph is brought in lesson six, which is the lesson Vav, which is the bridge, <laughs> right? There's also something else. Um, <clears throat> Rabbi Nachman specifically said that it took him six months to reveal lesson six. Wow. He started it on Shabbat Shuvah, right after Rosh Hashanah in between and right after Yom Kippur, right bef between. And he finished it at Purim, which is six months. As a little point so that people could understand a little bit of the greatness of Rabbi Nachman, Rabbi Nachman said that at the end of his life, he was doing in, in one moment, he was saying he was, he was doing in one hour what a person, what a tzaddik, what a real tzaddik, a tzaddik gamur, a tzaddik like the Arizal, the Baal Shem Tov, people like this, can do in 70 years, special holy souls. That was in one hour. At the end of his life, he said that he could do it in a moment. But I'm going to show you guys a little calculation so that people understand how long it took him, how long it would have taken a normal person, a tzaddik, not a regular person, a normal person to reveal lesson six. And that would have been only through special grantedness from the levels up there. If you do the math, because I tried to do the math for this, also it's very interesting. 
if you do 70 years, I'm going to try to turn this calculator the other way because it's going to be a big number. Whatever, let's see if it works. Unlock it. Oh, yeah, it's actually a good call. Dunno, you're a legend. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you take 70 years, okay, actually, we'll back it out. We'll do, let's do 70 years times, um, <clears throat> Let's actually break out the months first, right? So we said it's going to take six months. Six months, we'll get it down to hours because then we're going to multiply by 70 at the end because 70 years is essentially the amount of hours because we'll have to multiply by 365 as well. So if you break this down very simply, six months is essentially... 4,000. It's like 180 days, we'll say, right? Times 24 hours is about 4,320. And now we have to multiply by 70 years, right? So it's essentially times 365 times 70. And that comes out to about 110 uh, million years, more or less. But you said six months. Well, yeah. right? You, you, you no, because I did the 60 months in days. And then I essentially brought it down into hours. So I get it in hours because I wanted to show you in comparison of hours. Once we're in the, in the denomination of hours, I wanted to show you for him, that's in the number of hours that it is. But that hours is 70 years for other people. So we had to multiply it by years, okay? So for a regular tzaddik, it would have taken 110 million years, essentially, but to be able to reveal less than six. We have that same, <laughs> but you know, we have that same concept when the Arizal, when, when one of his students fell asleep oh, it under have been, his yeah. bed, and he was dreaming. Yeah. So the, the Arizal, it's a famous story. The Arizal had one time Rav Chaim Vital that was known as his famous main student. He's a huge Mekubal within his own right. The Arizal's main student, Rav Chaim Vital, wrote all the teachings of the Arizal, like Rabbi Nathan wrote the teachings of Rabbi Nachman. And the Arizal one time was sleeping and speaking in his sleep when he was uh, just napping on the couch for just a brief moment. And Rabbi Chaim Vital sat next to him to listen to the words because they were so attached to their Rabbanim, they wanted to hear everything that comes out of their mouth. The Arizal woke up shocked and he was like, what are you doing? He said, I wanted to listen to what you have to say. He says, you promised me and you made a promise to me that everything I ask of you, you have to tell me in this world. So Arizal said, fine, I'll tell you what I learned up there. He said, but for me to explain to you what I learned up there, I need to give you an introduction of 70 years. <laughs> and Rav Chaim Vital was a massive Mekubala. So that already was something very special because Rav Chaim Vital already was one of the main students of the Ramak, which was Rabbi Moshe Kordavero, who was the main Kabbalist of Tzfat before the Arizal came. So this was a person that was practicing practical Kabbalah openly and was an incredible level of a tzaddik. But 70 years of introduction. So there is a world, uh, there is a concept of time and space up there as well, but it's very, very special. Back to the, the Chidushin that were really brought about through this, and, and I said this, if you go to lesson six, which was very special, it took six months, it's lesson six, right? The Rabbi Barbachana. Rabbi Barbachana's story comes in lesson 14 of Likut Iman, which is referenced also to this parasha. Yaakov went for 14 years to try to gain protection at the yeshiva of Shem and 14, also, what did he do when he was there? He did the 14 Shira Malot that David eventually composed. David is the numerical value of 14. Daled, Vav, Daled. Daled is 4, Vav is 6, and then Daled again is 4. And then I looked a little bit deeper, and I saw that the, letter, the word David, <laughs> I just got a little bit tripped out by it. I saw that the word David is made up only of Vavs, if you think about it. It's a bar, a bar, a bar, a bar, a bar. If you think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so. so it was all about the concept of the connection with the tzaddikim. I love this. So, the so, so was what? No, because the whole concept. No, vav, 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 okay. Yeah. So what does it mean? Because, because David Amelach was the embodiment. It's actually a good point because I didn't really explain it. But David Amelach is the embodiment of not only bringing down the concept that Yaakov Avinu was the tzaddik that he connected with the Aleph, the Yud, the Yud, with the Vav. But David HaMelech as well, he, all he did was, like I shared the Midrash a few weeks ago, about how David HaMelech is nothingness in front of Hashem. So everything he does is a connection for Hashem and the Jewish people. That's why David HaMelech was the king of Bnei Israel. Because he made himself like nothing, and when you're like nothing in front of Hashem, Hashem essentially reveals everything to you. And so through David's connection and through David's acting as the Vav, over here as the connection, between Hashem and the world, so too David also has this concept within him. That's 
pretty much it. But I do have one last story of Rabbi Levi Yitzchak of Bardichev, mm -hmm. which I would like to share that kind of brings a little bit of all the stories and stuff like that together. So Rabbi Levi Yitzchak was one time approached. You can bring it out because I'm finishing up in the next minute. Like your friend? Yeah. <laughs> Rabbi Levi Yitzhak of Bardichev one time was approached by a man that was, that was telling him and he saw that he was really distressed. He was a chassid. He was a very special person. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm, 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 Wait one second. I'm really, I'm, 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 I'm competing. Yeah. That was Alia. Oh, this one? It's alright, we're almost done. Yeah. I'll do this. So, so just last one last thing. Yeah, we'll share it after. I just don't wanna I just don't wanna make a break in the in the recording. <laughs> All right. So yeah, last point and everyone can everyone can eat while I'm while I'm finishing the story. Um so Rabbi Levi Yitzchak of Bardichev one time was approached by a chassid. And the chassid was very poor and he had to marry off his daughter. And he had lost a lot of money and a lot of his wealth. And he didn't know what to do. So he came to Rabbi Levi Yitzchak asking for help. And Rabbi Levi Yitzchak told him, please um, go buy a lottery ticket because Hashem is going to give you great wealth. And he told him, aside from buying the lottery ticket, he told him, he said, I, I, have no f I have no doubt that you're right and that Hashem is going to give me great wealth. He said, but what about right now? I have to marry my daughter. And the lottery ticket could come true, but it could come true a lot in a long time in the future. So he said, I have emunah that Hashem is going to help me and give me the lottery ticket, like you said, but I just don't know when. So Rabbi Levi Yitzchak said, he's going to be with you now as well. And he's going to help you now as well. And this is a story that's referenced the parasha of the week. The reason why is I'll explain it at the end. The man, after he went from Rabbi Levi Yitzchak's house, he went and bought a lottery ticket and immediately on the way home, he stayed at an inn. He stayed at like a, a place to sleep for the night, a hotel. And in that hotel that he stayed, a man that was a very rich, noble man stayed as well that night. And he had a dream. And in that dream, he was told to find a man with a lottery ticket and change his lottery ticket for his lottery ticket. For his lottery ticket to exchange and to buy the lottery ticket for any price. Wow. So the, old, the noble man with all his guards and all his servants said, find me a Jew or find me someone here that has their lottery ticket. So they went looking. They said, we found someone. They brought him to him. And when they brought it to him, the, they started asking him and he said, let's exchange lottery tickets because you have a lottery ticket. No one knows who won yet. So it doesn't matter. And I'll also hand you a few hundred rubles. I'll also hand you some money. And he said, no, I'm not getting rid of this ticket, no matter what. And he said, okay. And he started working his way up. I'll give you a thousand rubles. I'll give you 2000 rubles. And he started making his way up to exorbitant sums of money. And the man wouldn't give it to him to the point that the man and the nobleman told all his guards and everyone, he said, take the lottery ticket from him by force. And when he did it, he felt so bad that he said, look, take the couple thousand rubles in payments and take my lottery ticket. But that's it. Like, I'm not dealing with this anymore. Mm -hmm. The man was down, the, the Jew, the simple chassid, and he went to Rabbi Levi Yitzchak to talk to him about it. Rabbi Levi Yitzchak told him, he said, not only will you win the lottery ticket because you had bad fortune, I had to change with the good fortune of the other man his lottery ticket into your hand so that you would win. But aside from the fact that you will win that lottery ticket, which he ended up winning, he said, I also made sure that you had money along the way to pay for your daughter's wedding. And so we connect that back to the parasha because in the secrets of it, when Yaakov realized this, when he saw the destruction of the two temples, he felt down. But when he saw the third temple being rebuilt, Hashem showed him that no matter what, not only am I going to give you the lottery in the future, I'm also going to be with you. I'm going to show you the letter Aleph right now. I'm going to be with you in the darkness of your despair today. And that's the money that he gave for the wedding. The wedding, because Rabbi Nachman, and this is where I end, Rabbi Nachman says very simply, the lesson that we learned from this lesson is that 
no matter what we do, all of what Rabbi Nachman brought down into the world, all his teachings are to show us that in the end, you don't despair because Hashem is with you no matter what. And whenever you do that, when a person despairs, it's because he doesn't see the letter Aleph. He doesn't see Hashem. But if he knows and learns from Yaakov and learns from this parasha, that even when you're suffering, Hashem is suffering. And even when you're happy, Hashem is happy and Hashem is with you in every single moment. He could then understand the letter Aleph and then he could start to look at Hashem in every single thing that he does. And when he does that, he realizes that there's nothing to be despaired about because Hashem is with him no matter what. And that's the truth and that's the meaning behind all these lessons. So wow. Bezat Hashem, may we have the merit of being able to see the, uh, the rebuilding of the third temple, the vision of Yaakov, and uh, all the bracha for all the Jewish people. Amen.